So to begin my talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, which starts with summer of last year. Um, effectively, what happened was the Bank of England announced that they were going to remove the last remaining woman from a banknote. And there were a number of individuals who felt that this would effectively suggest that historically women had not done anything important enough to be represented on the banknotes in England. So an individual called Caroline Criado Perez campaigned to have a woman put, put on a banknote and she was successful, which was fantastic, but she then received an enormous amount of abuse online. So I'm going to warn you that there will be one slide in which you will see some of the more graphic abuse, but I won't leave that slide up for very long. And there will be discussion of rape in this talk, I'm afraid. So that's a, a warning in advance. If you do want to make a quiet exit, I'm absolutely fine with that. So given uh, this particular scenario, we effectively applied to the ESRC. We were interested in looking at how, uh, how and why people send abusive and threatening uh, interactions online. Why do they think that it's okay to suddenly start sending rape threats to someone, for instance? Uh, why is it suddenly okay to tell someone, I'm going to bomb your house at 11.48 and there will be no survivors? Uh, so we applied to the ESRC, they gave us an urgency grant of £200,000 and using this we collected a month of data from beforehand and two months of data from after this particular instance with Caroline Criado Perez. When we started analysing the data, something that I realised quite quickly though was that you can't just look at these threats and this behaviour in isolation. It's not just that people go onto the internet and suddenly turn into horrible people, that there's a lot more going on than this. So I realise that we have to step back a bit, hence the title of the talk, and we have to look at other factors external to the internet that start to build up to this attitude that it's okay to behave like this. So I take quite a step back, and we're going to start with uh, advertising and products, particularly for boys and girls. So I talk mainly about misogyny and males and females, but that will broaden out as we go through the talk. So we find, for instance, if you look in advertising and the way that products are marketed at men and women, that women are beautiful and that boys are brilliant and women are pink and boys are blue. Um, and this doesn't just apply to colouring books for children. This isn't just you know, action, uh, action figures for boys and dolls for girls. We find that this is pitched at adults as well. So something as simple as chocolate, and you would think, no, chocolate's not gendered. Absolutely is. It's not available in pink. It's not for girls. So interestingly, we have to assume that it's for boys. Um, and if you thought, well, yes, okay, fine, there's, you know, Diet Coke and there's Coke Zero, one for girls, one for boys, it can't really go much further than that. There are surely some things that cannot be touched by gender distinction. You would be wrong. There is the Miss Bic pen. In case your feminine hand is too small for a normal pen, there is a nice lavender one with flowers for you. So effectively, we have an entire construction within advertising that men and women are different, that women are pretty, that they're effectively being, uh, moving towards being objectified, and in some advertising being objectified quite a lot. But that's not just in advertising. When we look in other types of forums, if you like, we find it too. So in headlines, this is just one from TMZ, uh, George Clooney reportedly engaged to hot successful lawyer. It doesn't matter that she's a human rights lawyer, it's nice that successful is mentioned and a lawyer is mentioned, but the first thing is the fact that she's hot. Now what's nice about this is that some people are starting to resist these kinds of discourses, so we find a really nice uh, counterexample from a magazine called Vagenda, and they produced this one, which I think is quite nice. <laughs> so. So effectively, they put her first and her accomplishments first, and it's the greying actor that she's married to. So you, you can see how that really sort of starts to uh, tackle these ideas. But it's not just in headlines as well, and this one is a little bit more of a, an unhappy example. So um, last year, or I think it might have been about a year and a half ago, there was the Steubenville case in America where... Um, there was a party, there were a lot of high school students there. I think most all of them were underage and they were drinking. Uh, there was uh, effectively a lot of errors of judgment that went on that night with uh, quite a lot of people. Uh, what happened was uh, a lot of the football stars from the football team were there. Uh, they effectively raped a young lady. Uh, she was gang raped, she was uh, unconscious, she was carried by her ankles and her wrists from party to party where she was assaulted numerous times. And what happens was they, they finally get enough evidence together, enough video footage and so forth. They take this to court. The young lady in question is sent death threats. She's hounded out of town. She has to leave town and change her identity because they feel that she is ruining their lives. Uh, and this is the reporting from CNN. As the verdict of guilty is handed to two of these footballers and they were the only two that were convicted, this is what the woman from CNN says. I've never experienced anything like it, Candy. It was incredibly emotional, incredibly difficult, even for an outsider like me to watch what happened as these two young men that had such promising futures 
Star football players, very good students, literally watched as they believed their lives fell apart. Now, what about the victim? So we've got star football players, they're very good students, they're convicted rapists. And if you even look in the little uh, blue band at the bottom, star football players, uh, two high school football stars found guilty of rape. But it's all about how she has effectively destroyed their lives. She, the, the victim has effectively become the perpetrator. So this then leads us into, we've got these attitudes in advertising, in the media, even in the press when they're reporting on cases. And this then takes us into the online environment where we start to find people who have internalized some of these ideas and started to think that it's okay to behave in this kind of way online. So we come back to Caroline Criado Perez. She's been successful. She's receiving all kinds of threats online. And this is just one of many of the, the threats that she got. So I'll read a couple to you. Uh, so he says uh, to her, blocked me other account, nice one, many more. So he's using, and we do know because he was actually convicted in the end and he spent time in jail for this. I think he used four accounts in the end. Uh, the police will do nothing, it's only Twitter. Uh, and then going up to the top one on the right, just think it could be somebody that knows you personally. Just to try and really set the intimidation level up there, it could be somebody that she is literally seeing face to face but doesn't know. Uh, come to Geordie Land, Newcastle, bitch. This is one of the reasons why he got convicted. He didn't realize that it's not smart to put your home city on Twitter when you're sending death threats to somebody. Uh, and then the last one, which was arguably one of the more menacing, I will find you, smiley face. And then individuals tried to jump in to protect her. So Stella Creasy, MP, uh, tried to jump in to protect her and got tweets like this. I'm going to be the first thing you see when you wake up. And a picture, I believe this is a still from the film Halloween of a man holding a knife. And I think the message in there is pretty clear that you know it's a death threat. Um, I'm going to very briefly show one slide, and I said I would do it quite quickly, of the number of threats, and this is a small selection that were sent to the women, and I'm going to put that off. Um, basically, they were inundated with a whole slew of threats. So we gathered the tweets from the month before, the two months after, and my interest, amongst many things, was to figure out what are the kinds of networks that these people start to form? How do they talk to each other? How do they get together? Because it's not just one individual. You have effectively loose networks of individuals ganging up, attacking someone. So this is everything from those three months. This was everybody tweeting at Criado Perez, Criado Perez tweeting back. So this is effectively a lot of noise, and what we want to start to find are the people who are abusive. So we pulled out the people who were risky. And here you can see the blue ones are people who were sending things that are pretty horrible, like, you know, uh, you're a bitch, you're nasty, uh, you're ugly, things like that, but not illegal. The red ones are ones that are easily crossing the bounds of illegal. I'm coming to find you. I'm going to do terrible things to you. So you can see that we have quite a big network of people, and the thicker the lines are, the more communications they're sending. So you've repeat offenders sending again and again, and Criado Perez is the little grey dot in the middle. So of course, my interest is in the really high-risk offenders. The, the low-risk ones are horrible, but you know, freedom of speech. So we look at the high-risk ones and start to look at what else do they do apart from just sending horrible threats. Well, we've got the misogyny. We've already talked about that. So these are the people who are sending clearly, openly misogynistic tweets like, go make me a sandwich, you should be in the kitchen, uh, I'm going to kill you if you don't, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but they also talk about genitalia, and I will let you fill in the blanks about what that's going to be. And some of these, and you'll notice that these are the same networks, and some of these individuals are repeat offenders for different things. They also talk about things like homophobia. So they're effectively sending uh, threats to people who are gay. They're talking about being gay. Uh, one of the words I apologize is the word faggot comes up a lot. So there's lots of really offensive language about people who are gay. And then finally, we also have racism. So I'm just going to flick through those slides quite quickly again. So you've got your high risk network, you've got your misogynist, and if you watch, you'll see the same offenders coming up again and again all the way through. So we've got some people who are effectively doing abuse across the spectrum and some people who are just particularly misogynistic and so forth. So for me, it's particularly interesting when people form into networks because that has a really serious effect on how extreme you can become. Um, the next slide effectively exemplifies exactly why I think this is so urgent. These two. So we have the individual from ISIS who's responsible for a number of beheadings. He appears to be from London, uh, from England. And we have Elliot Roger in the bottom right. Um, in case you're not aware of this case, in Santa Barbara at the beginning of this year, he uh, took his car and his gun and he killed seven people. 
What effectively happened with Elliot Rodger, and I'll talk about him more because we know more about him, he felt that women were horrible, that they owed him sex and that they were refusing it to him, that they were ganging up, that they were all sort of um, in this big community of people who hated him. And so he was writing things online, he was uh, posting videos, he was writing a manifesto where he was telling people over and over again, I hate those bitches, I think they're horrible, you know, how dare they turn me down? And then of course he took a gun and he shot um, people and he ran a few down. And effectively he joined communities where they reinforced his idea, they validated him and they said, yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right, women are horrible, there's a whole area of the internet called the manosphere. And we turn to the individual from ISIS, we know that individuals in this country and in other countries are joining groups where they find validation, where they are told, yes, you are you know, being treated badly, you are alienated, we give you a cause and a purpose, you should go do this thing. So for me, those networks that we can find where people are really engaging in extreme behaviour can potentially lead us to people who eventually go and do things like this, and that's why I think this is so important. Thank you very much.